Boa tarde. Good afternoon. É prazer. It is a pleasure for the South American Institute of Government and Health Designs, which is a body of the Health Council of the South American Countries, introduces its first conference, live conference, streaming over the internet. Those who are watching us on the internet, you can listen to the talk in English, Spanish, or Portuguese. You just have to click on the language. A missão do ISAG's mission is to transmit knowledge, to create discussions, carry out situational analysis, and also to bring the 12 countries together. In July this year, ISAG will uh, turn two years old, and uh, it's consolidating as a uh, realm where we come together in South America with uh, publications of uh, reports and in our portal in the internet. We also have collaborated with all ensure structures and guaranteeing uh, health and integration in the um, nations here. We are translating in the different languages the book Universal Health System in South America, Challenges for Universality, Integrality, and uh, we are now finalizing the translation into English that will be then ready to be downloaded from our website. Strengthening universal uh, systems and the right to health are one of the political pillars most important pillars on which all the work and strategy of the Institute is based on. So in order to broaden this debate, Isaacs, uh, with much pleasure and honor, invites Professor Aza Cristina Laurel. Aza Cristina is a medical researcher, uh, politician. She was born in Sweden, and she was naturalized as um, Mexican, and she is known, very well known for Latin American social health. She has a master's degree in public health, University of uh, California, in Berkeley, epidemiology, and also a doctor's degree in the Autonomous University of Mexico. She started her career in UNA in 1972 as a researcher and professor in the area of sociology, and uh, she then, medical sociology. She became a uh, group of scholars for the master's degree in Social Milk University. She coordinated postgraduate studies in this institution and she now works as a professor of uh, one, and uh, she was then invited to take over the uh, health secretariat for the capital city, Mexico City. She published many books, papers, and she is a leader in public health in Latin America and in the world, I would say, and it is a pleasure to then invite her to bring us uh, and honor us with her talk. Muito obrigada, Isaacs, por haver-me invitado. Thank you very much, Isaacs, for having me invited. This is a very important moment, and I believe that it's uh, the exact time for this. I would like to send uh, my congratulations to my colleagues and friends that are seeing us around the world. Because this debate that today we're going to have is a debate that is of our interest. The topic of my presentation is the health universal systems, the challenges that we may face. What uh, the content uh, that I'm going to debate with you, first of all, what universal coverage of health? Because this is a topic, it's relevant, but there are two great lines to understand this. Also, quickly, I'm going to stress the problems uh, of the health systems in Latin America in the conviction that what they could solve in the reforms of one or another side are these problems. The third topic that I'm going to deal with 
It's a comparative analysis of the SUS and uh, the insurances and the as a central topic. This is a very important topic because we have a debate in many cases. It's a little confusing because we use the same words, but we want to mean things that are totally different. What are the results and problems of the insurance, health insurances in Latin America? And what are the results and problems of the US? And uh, I'm going to get uh, into the topic of how do I see the path that we should follow. I'm going to limit to discuss Latin America because the topic is a topic, very wide topic. If you want to make any questions, specific uh, questions of what's happening in other parts of the world or what's happening in uh, determined countries, I could answer that. And depending on the knowledge that I have on th this issue. I'm not going to have a, uh, only references to the different countries because that uh, is, uh, we have no time for that. First question, what universal coverage? I would like to say that everybody is talking about universal coverage in health, and uh, they are headed by the supranational bodies and uh, by the private foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, Bill and Linda Gates, and also very clearly positioned in this the Lancet magazine that is publishing systematically, but also from a long time ago, we uh, on the social medicine current, we have spoken about this universal coverage on health. That's why I, see, I say that this is an issue to be discussed by all of us. But I think that it's not very well understood. Also, I would like to mention that Latin America, there is a consensus regarding um, the reforms that should be carried out. But also, there is the same confusion about this. What I would like to stress, first of all, that there are two great conceptions regarding the universal coverage. One, it proposes that to solve the problems of the health systems in the countries and to reach the universal coverage, we should introduce competence market pluralism of the administrators and those who furnish the services. And this current, what is proposing is the introduction of a health insurance. The other conception is to have what in Brazil is called, uh, because they have worked uh, for a long time, it's a single system, public single system of health. So this system is not acting in this system what is the market and uh, most important to have access to the system. You don't need to have an insurance or to pay for the services. And this is what we call the SUS, you should understand that we're not referring to the SUS from Brazil, but to a system, public and single and unique public health system. From my point of view, what are the relevant issues that we should verify in this proposals? First of all, I think it's very important the right to health, because it's not uh, very clearly stressed 
and this uh, health insurance. When we're talking about the right to health, what we require is to know who is the subject that is uh, forced to guarantee this. If we do not have a subject, there is no sense in this. And also, I would like to see in both cases the coverage and universal access because in many occasions in the discourse it's understood understood by coverage the uh, populational coverage the whole population should have an insurance but that not indicates the coverage of services and the access to this coverage. A very important issue that is discussed today, and probably the most discussed problem and debated, is the financing of these health services. And what we're going to see are the sources, the funds, who administers this and uh, purchases the services, who give the services and uh, the human resources and physical resources that are enough will cover this. Of course, if I declare that it's a right to health, if you do not have the services to give this uh, service or rehabilitation also, that's impossible. What in Mexico we call, we salute the flag, we salute the symbol, but there is no content or reality in it. And what's the impact in the health conditions and the well-being of the population? Because for some analysts, it's not within this problematic. And I question myself if it's not to have an impact in the well-being of the population, then what's the use of this uh, health system? because these health systems exist for that. Not to have more businesses going around. And finally, I think it's very important to have a present in all and uh, assessments of the national systems. What was the history of construction and constitution of this uh, health system is going to depend on this. What, are, what is the process to transit through this new configuration of the systems? Quickly, what are the health, uh, the uh, health system problems in Latin America. In general, and up to now, there are systems that are segmented and have lack of financing. That's uh, in general. In the health systems, historically talking, the social security is the strongest uh, segment and is the result of a corporate pact between the state, the entrepreneurs, and uh, the unions. The social security, usually the ministries are weak, have a very low capacity of regulating this, or only that are in charge of the tax of public health. Also, we should say that both systems were losing the financing through the crisis and the structural adjustment. The mechanism for this was different in the different areas. And social security essentially depended on a drop in salaries and the uh, growth of unemployment or informal employment, while the ministries was a drastic cut of their financing of the budget. So we could say that in the majority of the countries, 
We have physical and human resources that are not sufficient. There is a bad distribution, geographical distribution of infrastructure, and also an unequal distribution, social distribution of the services and the personnel. And in the services, <coughs> there is a domain of particular interest above the general interest, understanding the general interest as a capacity to improve the health conditions and the well-being of uh, the citizens. This uh, private interest could be different types, could be legitimate ones, for example, Questions re uh, what were conquered by the workers that are legitimate. The use of a public institution, a private institution, for personal use, that we see this in nearly all the countries under the way of a corruption. <coughs> in this uh, system of health, the private sector <coughs> grew quickly depending on the country <coughs> within the public systems in the space left in the public system there the private sector grew and this private sector receives subsidies cross subsidies in the sense that they concentrate money income through they go to the private sector to attend the population and due to the fact of uh, the public systems that could be done through public uh, funds, transfer to private, exemption of taxes, etc. And I think it's important to know that this deficiencies of the public services was a substrate of the reforms in health. <coughs> was, uh, let's say, practically what they say, they're not solving the problems of the public services, you should put the private services. What you understand, and this is the conditions and uh, why the public services are passed. And that's in a characteristic of the public services, this problem of lack of coverage and lack of financing. But that was one of the most important arguments. What we're going to see now <coughs> are the uh, issues and uh, relevant problems uh, compared to this. What are the basic characteristics? Well, we have the guarantee to the right of health, the relationship between public and private, and the social responsibility of the state. Coverage, access, and usage, well, we're going to be able to see the population coverage and service coverage, access, and the use of the services required, access to drugs, the organization of the systems, what I want to see, some characteristics of the models of attention, what are the possibilities of planning, and what's the possibility of acting <coughs> on the social determinants. And finally, the financing of the system and the administration of this. The sources, uh, the administration of the financing, the pooling that I, I put the name in English because the translation in Spanish is totally absurd. It's something like doing things together. But uh, equality and transparency, equity and equality and transparency. And what's the impact in the health conditions and well-being and human dignity? 
We are now going to see topic by topic and making a comparison am among them. As regards the basic conception of the systems, you have this SOS and we have health insurance, which are the two big great proposals that we have today. And, um, you will coincide with them, but the hegemony, the dominant feature are health insurance. The first topic is the guarantee of the right to health for the public and unique systems of city. This is, this is something very important because they are established to guarantee the right to health. It doesn't mean that there are no problems in the organization or funding problems, but this is really what happens. In the health insurance system, we have the first difference, not necessarily they have the guarantee to health. Moreover, frequently they limit it, they ignore it, or they deny it. And we may say that this is uh, something new because after the world, everybody was uh, agreeable in this, in the right of health. But since the 90s, and they started to say that no, what we have to do is to guide the systems in another direction, which is the public and private relationship in the sole health systems by nature is a public nature they have, as their name indicates. However, we have also to bear in mind and the difficulties that are implied because there might be contractual relations with private providers of services. They may be professionals in their own professions or the medical company. And there may be intermediaries by administrators or managers for both. The logic of an insurance, health insurance, is to to have a division, a separation between the duties, the funding duties for the purchase of services, the provision of services, and the regulation. Strictly speaking, the regulation is what the state should do. And the other duties could be provided by, private, by the private sector. If you see the administration of the funds and the purchaser or the f financing entity, in the universal system of health, they are public, or there may be a system with an only payer, which is the state fund, but where we can see or we can have private provision of services. This is the, in the health insurance typical. This may vary. The administrators and managers and buyers are in the hands of the public and also private, but they, they have competition. Um, between them in order to uh, manage and buy the services, private and public. And this is done through an in-house or an internal or domestic market. Each one of the instances, public instances, are uh, have a competition among them. And this leads to the outer competition. The regulation is also important to point out. In the SUS, you have an internal regulating body. And in the health insurance system, the instance is external and public. Here we have a criticism. Sometimes they say, uh, if it is an internal instance, then we may have a conflict of interest because the state regulates its own services. But what is not said when there is when there is an external instance, what it is not said is that it is really, really difficult to regulate 
private services. If this is not created, all the American literature on this is very vast. As regards the coverage on universal access, what we may say is that, first of all, we have what we must understand as the coverage for the population. And this means that everybody is covered by the system, which is different to the coverage of services. I underline this because very frequently there is a confusion among both terms. When we say universal coverage of the health insurance, what we are referring to in the best of cases is the coverage for the population, not referring to the coverage of health services. The SUS has uh, coverage for the population by definition because it's a public system, a unique system. So they ha it has to cover all the population. Then we have to open that in terms of access. In the uni insurance, health insurance, universe, universality refers to the coverage for population, and this is very important to bear in mind, because this doesn't mean there is no judgment what is being covered. In fact, everybody has in their hands uh, insurance uh, document. This is for two aspirants or one medical consultation. This is uh, another debate. But we have also said that to date and so far, health insurance that is an example in Latin America, those who have chosen in any case have been able to achieve population coverage. 10 or 20 percent is missing according to the case. In Mexico, being very benevolent, 20 percent of the population lacks coverage. In Colombia and Chile, more or less, 7 and 10 percent of the population that has no coverage at all, notwithstanding it is uh, compulsory. Service, uh, service coverage in the SUS, they, all the existing services are covered. This doesn't mean that there are no problems regarding, as we will see later, if it is a unique and public system, the services that exist have to be provided. In, in the health insurance area, there is a definition and there is a cost of packets of services according to the relationship cost-benefit. And they are limited or restricted or they may be brought according to the payment that the person of the family do. And this is very important to bear in mind because if we have for example, an example I gave you, if you have the services that have uh, those people that have the uh, public insurance in Mexico, is 11 percent of the services that they have a working contract, for example. This is related to the access to the services because having coverage doesn't mean access and use of the services. We have to make a distinction in this. And in the SUS, in principle, yes, there is access to services and medicines, but, and it's important to highlight this, there are some geographical, bureaucratic, and cultural barriers that have to be addressed. The fact that there are, they exist doesn't mean that they are not, uh, they cannot be uh, resolved. In the health insurance, they depend strictly on the design of the packages, health packages. And here we have a difference between the basic packages or programs 
and the those which are hired according to the payment of a higher premium. And in general, in those packages, we have different kinds of payment for this and for medicines or for this type of diseases and so on. And we have economic barriers in this. Not only the geographical ones, or cultural ones. And I also believe that this is a very relevant difference because exactly they have the same or they bear the same problem, the SUAs and the insurance. But in the second case, we also have the persistence of the economic barrier. Well, as you know, this doesn't mean that I'm making, I am not in specifying each one of the countries for many reasons. One of them is the lack of time. And a second reason is that if we start to see all the variables in each country, we won't be able to highlight what I would like to inform to you. The organization of the systems in the first instance I think that the motive of attention to the public is important. And also we have a difference that I would say it's substantial and uh, final in the comparison. In the SUS, they tend to be integrated and according to different scale on the basis of education, promotion, and prevention. However, in health insurance systems, there is, they are centered, their attention is on the attention to the specific individual because the topic, the theme of the insurance is for a family or for an individual. So it is person centered. And this is strengthened and deepened because the incentives to performance are generally related to the attention to the individual. For example, incentives, uh, performance incentives, how many patients have you had this day? For example, again, which is or which was the uh, surgeries that they were used, but they are not focusing how many uh, collective uh, practices or conversations for education on health, on the health area. And also in the attention to the community, and as it is centered in the person, the actions, the actions uh, on public health. What we have to do then is to have a to have a parallel health structure and community health system. For example, in Mexico. Everything that has to do with the first education, promotion, and prevention has a different budget, which is addressing the health of the community. And they include their uh, vaccination and so on. But as regards the health centers, which is the first level where the people go, they are mainly devoted to the attention to the person or to the individuals. So this uh, type of collective attention uh, 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 are not uh, highlighted. Obviously, this is worse when there is a competition between multiple providers and multiple managers of the funds. Because here we see everything, the health uh, question gets dissolved, particularly the health um, system that has to do with health.
And this also has been demonstrated, for example, in Colombia, where there was a very important outbreak of diseases which were believed to be controlled, for example, TB, paludism, and so on. Well, if we have a health system which is or which are, uh, which have deficiencies or problems in terms of infrastructure, in terms of staff and so on, the topic of planning is highly important. It is very important and see because if we want to solve the problems, if we have to have remedies to the problems in the health system, we have to uh, we have to have some planning process. In the SUAs, in principle, we may have a strategic and national or local planning for a certain period of time where we may have the priorities at the middle or long terms. And also, we may build little by little from the bottom according to the needs in terms of health. What I mean by this is that we can say, well, let's give priority to regions uh, which are more abundant, or uh, give priority to small uh, districts and so on, where we are going to build the basis of the system. This is the first step, also the less complex activities. In the health insurance cases, when you have many providers, planning becomes more difficult. Strategic planning becomes more difficult. And as we are giving priority, She's managing the slides. As we are giving priority to the attention to the person, to the individual, what we are going to do is that providers will be uh, working, taking into consideration the income and the revenue of the services. So there is little possibility to have a to have a balance that may build the system with a strategic vision. For that reason, as I said, this is a short-term planning with financial criteria, a topic which is uh, very discussed in all the areas is the need to act on the social and economical determinants that means there's an intersectoriality or cross-sectoriality at a certain moment. And if we compare the two kinds of systems, we will find that in the SUAs, we have a minister which is a part of the um, uh, executive and where the policy of health is part of a social integrated policy. And this builds possibilities which are relevant in order to have this inter or to permit this intersectoriality. I sh would emphasize here that in general the health policy is part of the social policy, and this means that mm, a lot of things that have to do with the social determinants are uh, uh, other ministries are in charge of that. In the health insurance, where you have multiple managers and providers of services who um, prioritize in the attention to the person, this possibility is uh, lower because we may say that they have a sort of uh, exterior of the organs that form the policies of the ministries. And even, and here we have a paradox, because in general, where you have the health 
insurance, they have a central logic, which is the predominant logic, let's say, economic and social logic, but but mm, the performance of the policies uh, ha have negative effects for the determinants of social determinants. More poverty, more un underemployment, or unemployment, and so on. Financing of the administration of the system. In the uh, SUS, in principle, the source of financing are public resources that could uh, are the result of uh, taxes, uh, different taxes that are applied to. This uh, way of financing the systems has a uh, failed situation in the sense that they are exposed to what are called uh, the fight to distribute those taxes among the different ministries. Our priority is education, then we're going to take out a certain amount of money from the Ministry of Health. But uh, when uh, we have economical problems uh, or economic crises, it's more probable that this type of financing could be exposed to uh, the cuttings. This is something that should be taken into account. Yes, in this way, but we have to know that this is the way it is. In uh, the health insurance, we could see there are different types of financing and that are very complex. The Colombian system, for example, what is happening, even though it's a bankrupt, it's bankrupt, and everybody recognizes that it's bankrupt, starting from the government to the rest, it was bankrupt. There's no money. But they weren't able to transfer the financing to the demand, give to the patients money so they could take care of themselves what they want, that it's the condition, primary condition for this. According to the experts of the World Bank, they were able only to pay 20% of their demand or the needs. And uh, there are several types of a single fund, uh, multiple administrators or managers of this. So all the countries, uh, Colombia has a system, Brazil has another system, the Colombian has mentioned as bankrupt, Chile has another system. There are several differences and variables regarding this. One of the topics is the, the level of pooling of the funds and risks. In the SUS, uh, in the SUS, there is a paradox. We know what we talk about because one of the great virtues of the health insurance that thing has a great level of pooling. The SUS has total pooling, so there is no problem in that because all the resources are directed to the system. While in the insurance systems, the funds, uh, the administrators uh, has enough uh, people to show them a case of a very expensive disease would take them to bankruptcy. Also, what is evident that the, this uh, system requires a compensation system. If you uh, provide freely 
uh, the service, at a certain moment you should see how this balance is carried out. And this has generated very high cost in transaction. Uh, the expenditure in the SUS system, it's low in principle. But uh, while this different type of obstacles exist, that it could have a very important expenditure in the introduction of the private plants and the health within the systems in this SUS in, in existence. This uh, pocket expenditure is valuable according to the coverage that each insurance has. But we could say that it's typical that they have payments in all of them. Uh, the con cost uh, cut and efficiency is something that is uh, very discussed. The insurance, uh, it's good for this, but one part, how we can uh, cut costs and increase efficiency in SUS. I think that this is a topic of regulation of the technologies, of the drugs, and uh, high costs have to do mainly with the introduction and not a very reasonable condition of technology and new drugs. They should have a, a strict regulation regarding the fact that we should see not to, to let this cost of blow up and we have an idea promoted by all the media, the best medicine is the one that has the best uh, drugs, the best equipment, and that is something that is not true. The health systems, uh, the uh, health insurance have more difficulties because it's a regulation very difficult to carry it out outside of cost and efficiency. Among other things, because it's a logic, a different logic, where I, if they pay me better, if I do certain type of intervention, equality and equity, if we talk about the uh, SUS, the pure ones, in principle, it's high if we understand uh, for this access, equal access to the required services in face of the same need. And in the insurance uh, services, there is an inequality, important inequality, according to the social condition, economical social condition of the uh, insured and is subject to the rules of uh, inspection of uh, the uh, funds of the government. And this doesn't happen in the insurer systems because here they don't involve multiple transactions between public, private, what one part is uh, private, and I could argue that as our private contracts are not inspected by the, by the public sector. The regulation is internal in the SUS and, and the health insurance is internal, external, the public part is internal and external. And there is a lot of difficulties to be able to carry out this regulation. It's incredible the capacity that the private insurance have of inventing ways of not complying what is determined or what is not insured. We're going to make a summary, a quick summary, to be able to open the floor to a debate. The intention of this uh, conference 
was to allow us to have what is the universal system and the health insurance, what are the advantages and disadvantages of both, to be able to think clearly. Of course, in reality, they're mixed. But it's important also to take into account the meaning of each of them. What are the results and problems of these insurance, uh, health insurance? As I said, in Latin America, they weren't able to have universal coverage in, uh, in any case. And there is a strong problem regarding the adverse selection and moral risk that the people doesn't uh, use the insurance because they don't need it. And the moral risk is the exclusion of those who are not object to be insured. There is a confusion very important in all discourses regarding the populational coverage and the service coverage. If we're not able to distinguish one with the other, it's impossible to know where we are. There are packages of services uh, with differences according to the type of insurance. So, you have basic packages, intermediate packages, uh, uh, higher level uh, packages, extra good packages, and that depends on the equality and equity. Access and usage of the services is not guaranteed and it's clearly not an equity. Uh, of course, we have the inclusion exclusion, the new certification, where the poor in the Colombia example are included through a mechanism that they have. But those who make five cents more are excluded. And uh, they're, gonna, they're also calculating the amount of people that are going to be included and excluded in the different types. The pocket expenses uh, are high or the prepaid or excluded services. In the Mexican case, for example, what is not included in the package of services and the popular insurance is paid totally by the patient. And also, we have the situation that the people buy complementary insurances to complement what uh, they had. For example, this pocket expenses in Mexico of those who have the popular insurance, for each peso that they expend uh, in this pocket expenses of the uh, popular insurance includes 95 cents. So the pocket expense is larger than volume or what is expended, officially, because it's not expended, really. But we're not going to get into detail in this. There is a weakening in uh, this area because of what I mentioned. It's very difficult to carry out epidemiological surveillance when you have a lot of providers of services because it's difficult to receive reports from them. And uh, there is a policy aligned with a neoclassical and neoliberal paradigm. But this works negatively as social and economical determinants, higher level of unemployment, lower education. Then I'm going to, not going to get into this debate. In the second place, there was an increase in public expense in all cases. 2% of the uh, GDP in Colombia, for example. But they have high cost of transaction as insurers. The payment between the different levels, it's very costly. 
and practically all the increase in public resources have gone, were directed to the private, and a lot has disappeared in corruption because it's difficult to control this. The scandals of corruption in Colombia, you should read them because they're incredible. There is an inequality in financial resources according to the social, economical, and territorial conditions. There is a budgetary crisis, Colombia is a case, and they go towards the reduction of the services. There is an expansion on infrastructure with financing criteria and profit uh, criteria. There is an administration with a businessman criteria and uh, the employment also by third parties. This has uh, taken to a weakening of the private services because they are exposed to unloyal competence, while the private services can uh, outsource uh, the jobs, etc. The public services are not allowed to. In Colombia, for example, the first the health fund pays the private, and it uh, has something left that pay the public. So the strongest, uh, the higher debt is with the private system. Of course, there is a, da a debt also with the public uh, providers. And in Colombia, has taken to the destruction of what is public. They have closed hundreds of hospitals and uh, 70,000 workers were expelled. The results of the problems of the SUS. According to the trajectory of the SUS in Latin America, they were very important uh, for the Constitution. From Brazil to Bolivia, there was a social mobilization, even though the social mobilization not necessarily were maintained, was maintained through time. And here, in red, political decisions that were crucial because the political will, mm, that word, I can, uh, maybe I have will, but I have all the priorities and then I, I'm not going to do it. So the political decision is crucial. Also, it was within the reconstruction or construction of the social state and the redistribution of it. We see this in the Constitution. And the new constitutions of Venezuela, Ecuador, Bolivia, they mention this. Uh, there is an explicit forbidding to privatize these institutions. Also, an increase of access and important usage, but not a complete one. And that should be taken into account. Also, an increase in strengthening of services of low and medium complexity, but we had the need of infrastructure and personnel, so uh, we don't think that's a problem solved. That is a labor question that was inherited that I called the transposition of uh, institutional bureaucratic values where the particular interest uh, prevail over the general interest. There are compensatory providers. The uh, physicians work five hours a day. Why? Because they're not able to pay. They're living them a period of time free to make money. You cannot manage a system 
uh, where you have people working five hours a day. Uh, they're depending on the diversity of the providers because in this scheme is included due to the lack of infrastructure is included the private Providers. There is a strengthening of uh, actions and sanitary safety that could be integrated in the same system. There is an increase in capacity of strategic planning and actions over social economical determinants. What we can say is that in all the cases, the SUAs in Latin America continue to be segmented. There are, or in many cases, we have the Ministry of Health continues to have social security, for example, in Venezuela, is the case in Bolivia. And the private sector is present in all of them also. These are systems that still have a very strong, I'm not referring to Brazil, they have, uh, they have an inheritance of the neoliberal reforms that those countries had. So they have vertical programming, uh, focalized insurance for some cases. They are very, very complex. And as we are resolving those questions, there is a relationship between the public force and the private area. And also, I believe that it is very important to bear in mind which is the role of private insurance in each one of the systems. Funding or financing is legally established but is sensitive to the economic cycles. There's certain fragility in the distribution and when even it is priority, even health is a priority in some states which are very poor, absolute poverty, for example, in the case of Bolivia, although it is a priority, they cannot fund it or finance it. There are difficulties with decentralization in all cases, either the one in Ecuador and Bolivia or the new decentralization, for example, in Brazil. So decentralization of the system produced new problems. And other kind of problem is the contraction of parallel programs and the integration of the SUAs. For example, very importantly in Venezuela, what we have is on one side, Barrio Adentro, which is the SUAs in Venezuela, which is not unique for everything, because we also have the social security system, which is public, and they were not, uh, were not able to uh, communicate them. So we have two parallel systems. So, we are coming to the end of this talk. I would like very quickly to say that in order to ensure the right to health and universal coverage in the area of health, first of all, we need a social covenant with a social Mm, and distributive and broad social policy. Without it, it's impossible to go beyond. In the second place, we need to build the popular and the involvement of the people because they have to be defended. It is very difficult in other otherwise. Also, we have to ensure, I am speaking by my own experience, a great institutional agreement, public institution, where the general answers, the health of the population, 
will prevail on the private interest over the private interests. There um, should be a program of um, increasing unsustainable public resources, planning investment in infrastructure. And also we have to um, build from bottom to top. We have to eliminate superfluous expenses and in some cases are scandalous in terms of salaries, privileges, uh, cars, and so on, and corruption. And I believe that we a lot of money is being spent in all this. We have to innovate the institutions on the basis of the strengthening, on the basis of transparency, and the alignment of the processes for attention to the public and administrative processes. And of course, we have to create a new institutional culture. We cannot uh, uh, leave all those aside. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Laurel for that excellent presentation that has allowed us to see the two great models that are being proposed to achieve universality in terms of health. And we want to point out that at this moment you have more than 300 connections. And also we have 20 countries. Our greetings from the Isaacs to all these countries, to all these people. And some of them, a good number of those connections are connections, collective connections. That means to say, there are classes dedicated in schools of public health, in departments of health, of social medicine, which are devoted to participate and get involved in this conference. Thank you very much to all of you for your involvement, for your participation. And we hope that technology have, um, has been useful to reach you. And also our greetings to our distinguished audience that is here today. Let's, uh, Cristina, we will continue with the question and answer uh, session. We have received um, some 12 questions. I have organized them in four blocks. The first one on the questions that have to do, which are the first one that we receive with the topic on human resources. There is a question that comes from the Polytechnic School of Health in Via Cruz that says, how is it possible to think and achieve universal coverage without taking into consideration the topics related to the management of and training of human resources in this world where the commercial logic is in the education. How is it possible to have professionals and technicians duly um, trained when their training is a commercial one. Thank you very much for that interesting question. And in the same order of ideas, Dr. Temporon is making a comment also, which uh, probably his experience at the ministry was very strong and has to do with the commitment and the involvement of the medical corporation. Is it possible to achieve, to make transformation in the health systems without taking into consideration, without considering, without having the commitment of the medical corporation? And a third one that comes comes from Brazil is asking us to uh, is asking you to comment on privatization of hospitals which usually comes together with precarious services and this has a very negative impact in the training of professionals in these three questions uh, we have the topic of universal coverage and the professionals, technicians, and the people necessary to achieve their duties. Yeah. 
Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Well, I believe that in fact, in everyday life, in the health services, the topic of human resources is a very relevant one. And I believe that what is being asked has to do precisely with the different uh, steps of the problem. I believe that there has been, for a long time now, as I said during my talk, there is the logic of the public instruction has been lost on many occasions because what was a commitment with the institutions and with the patients has been disappearing little by little. So is there have been a change of values of the institutions. And I believe that you have to work very strongly and we have to address the topic. Perhaps it's one of the most relevant topics to be addressed. And I think that how it is going to work, the institution of health is the training and education has an economic viewpoint. When you see when the, the doctors are distributed in specialities, so there is a very strong economic incentives because the sub 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 specialty not only provides more money, but allows to make a certain uh, chantage that you we see, but that we see in Bolivia. Well, the uh, the anesthetist they said, which is not a substance, but we we go, uh, we don't work, and, and nothing happens. So, obviously. This immobilized the whole system because there were not this kind of doctors or specialists. So I believe that we have to make an effort in this regard. And above all, this is a political and ideological struggle, a political and ideological fight because this is nothing easy, you can do it overnight, but this topic is a very relevant topic because if there is no an institution agree, agreement, it's very difficult to improve the institutions. Uh, privatization and the um, training suffers because if a, ho a private hospital is working essentially with private doctors which are not full-time doctors, the service is not provided. So no systematic training is permitted. Thank you very much, Cristina. Here I have two questions that come from Central America. And they asking Cristina to comment the case of Costa Rica. Please provide a comment on Costa Rica that has the universal uh, coverage and a system based on insurance covers almost all the situation, and I think it is important to address this topic. Well, the, top, the thing in Costa Rica is very specific because Costa Rica, in fact, has a system of insurance, but what is relevant in this case is that Costa Rica had universal coverage before this. Uh, there was a series of problems in the new system because they provide the services, there was a social security, and the uh, financing entity that had control is the Ministry of Health. And I think we cannot say that this is a very successful system in terms of insurance because the coverage, almost universal, existed before. There are some questions that have to do with financial aspects and with political aspects. I will refer to the financial questions. From the service, they said, please 
comment on the growing number of private um, insurance in Latin America and the process through which that private sector captures public funds. There is a similar question also that comes from Venezuela where they said that there is a lot of cross-subsidies from the public budget to some clinics and insurers, and the public sector is an element that strengthens and for the benefit of the private sector. That is important also to address. Please, Cristina. I believe that uh, one of the great uh, topics at, uh, today is a contradiction, a type of contradiction that originally was outside of the model, but now uh, has uh, turned something internal of a model. When we talk about universal access to the services required in with an explicit position of access to health and in public institutions that are not very well developed. At that moment, we have a internal contradictions in the sense that to be able to comply with the right to health, the public institutions passes through these problems. And there is a very important transference of public resources towards the private sector. And in those terms also, I believe that we have a phenomenon promoted and strengthened through the media that has to do with the, the social uh, imaginaries, which is a good medicine, and what gives certain social status. The phenomena that uh, you buy uh, plans of uh, an insurance company with a very small coverage, you also have a possibility of going to the public system. But I could, as I have a, uh, uh, an insurance, that's part of the uh, social status. So probably that's the less important thing. I would like to go back to what we talked before, that we were not on the air, the issue that uh, in some uh, occasions, and more frequently, the unions, trade unions, are negotiating with private insurance company, health insurance company. And that doesn't mean that sh those who should be defended the public system are not defending it. In, in Mexico, for example, even though they try to include the private plans, they weren't able to penetrate up to now. Not more than 4% of the population has private plans. So it depends on how this public system is working. And in Europe, it's very clear. You do not buy private plans because you have good public systems. Why I want to buy a private one. So we have a strong topic here that has to do with the strengthening of the public system. So to avoid continuing with this, and uh, very unfortunate that the system, there is a great transference of uh, public funds to the private. We should take into account this and think how this is uh, 
possible to improve. We have a block of questions, more political block. Sulami Mahin is making us a question that I read textually. What are the opportunities of progressing, real progress, of the universal systems, not as an ideal model, but as a concrete system in territories occupied by the health insurance uh, companies. That is a question from Colombia, also that asking to comment the relations of uh, power and the real configuration of the right to health between the confrontation and the universal systems and the insurance system. Paulo Bus uh, made a comment in the, the present moment, the health system based on the right have to face very strong economical crisis produced by the financial capital, but there are restrictions to progress. And the last one, this is referred to social movement. I think that the question uh, regarding the perspective, real perspectives, I think that that's a question that cannot be answered abstractly. The answer should be built at, in each uh, country. There is no formula, magical formula that fits all and could solve this question. And I think that that has to do with some of the topics that I mentioned before and have to do with a social pact regarding this. You should have a redistribution of resources to this to happen, an institutional pact, how you get to uh, talk with the uh, physicians, etc. That question cannot be answered. What I tried to do in my presentation was a type of a typology in the characteristics of one system and the other. What I wanted to stress out is that the possibilities of complying with the right of health are stronger or higher in the universal system, the SUS that we know, as there are in Latin America. I could say that the uh, public insurances uh, in countries in Europe, for example, have characteristics that have nothing to do with the insurance, uh, health insurance services that are being introduced as an hegemonic uh, position. Uh, Sweden, that everybody has access to the health system, is an insurance. The problem is that nobody has it in the hand, uh, so you know that you're insured. But it's a universal system of health, so you have the insurance by the government. I tend. The question of Paulo is a very interesting question, but I would uh, try to phrase it uh, in a different way. I believe that uh, what's happening in Europe at the present moment, it's uh, an issue that was predictable since 2008. What happened was uh, that the great financial banking crisis, what they recommended the countries in Europe and the United States was to make an anti-cyclic economy to stimulate the employment and demand. 
And after four years, they said, you are in, in debt. And, uh, you have a very high debt. So you have to stop expending. You, we should have rules of austerity, yes. But I believe, that's my point, personal point of view, that they took advantage of the opportunity of destroying or try to destroy, because this history hasn't finished, the social states in Europe. Because if you see the debt level before the crisis in 2009, those over in the excess debt were two, United States and England. And they have a very interesting characteristic. They have monetary sovereignty that the rest of the countries in Europe do not have. So they applied the recipe that we have suffered, and we know other things. That's not going to solve the problems. And we shouldn't confuse what is a real crisis and what is a crisis where you force the countries to apply a certain economical scheme because those who have the decision, in this case, to do whatever, that was a double movement. They said anti-cyclic poly economical policy. Why you have such amount of debt we should cut them. Cristina, I have some questions here. Pablo Amarante is uh, asking a double question, uh, which is related to three other questions, and the relevance for this topic of the participation and social control. Another one also refers what is the role of social organizations and moving in the building of these systems of health, universal systems. Another one doesn't see the country, but they, she asks, how would it incorporate interculturality to the universal health systems? And Felix refers to the liaison, not only of social movement, but also of urban reform related to the health reform, which apparently they are divorced divorced. There is another question, but Paolo, that is not related to this blog, but as it is very important, I would like to mention it. Paolo says, please comment, Cristina, on why, which social determination and not determinant. Why is it determinant or determination, social determination or social determinant? I believe that, and also it is, uh, we can demonstrate an evidence that popular participation for the construction of social systems is highly, highly relevant. And I'm going to say it in a different wording. I believe that universal systems of health in Europe, for example, is uh, uh, thanks to the involvement, particularly in groups of the organized population, particularly in the unions. And I, I wouldn't say uh, from Bismarck, even when the unions were the main force, Bismarck systems were not established. So only social security for this. Kind. But for example, if we have all the social democracy in the northern countries, nothing to do with the one that exists today. They created the universal systems 
based on the union. The social basis uh, was the union. If you see, what is the process in Spain? They try to construct an insurance system with the BP, and they were not able to achieve it. I am speaking about the Moncloa after the Moncloa Pact. Um, they had a system, a unique system, where the organizing forces had a very important role. So I believe that the participation and involvement on social control are very, very important. Under which form it is presented, this involvement and participation by the public? Depending on the country, I can say that at present that they are not the bearers of the idea of the unique health system in Bolivia are the movement, are the popular movements. They are not the parties, political parties or the unions. In Bolivia, that means to say at this moment, the ones who are forming an opposition uh, yeah, um, were the unionized members of society. And we go beyond it results that the, those syndicalized or uh, unionized workers of the public sector that didn't want their systems to disappear. Not because they were better, because that was a very area of power, very important for those unions. And in those terms, again, the involvement of the public is important. And I would like also to say uh, that I have the opportunity now that when we say that we do, we have to it has to become a state policy, and that means to say that there should be a covenant, uh, a, a political covenant between the parties, because if there is, n we don't have the support, a popular agreement cannot, the state policy, according to my understanding, this may be discussed, is that something becomes a policy of a state where there is a broad social agreement on the specific issue. So, see, we have the right in, in power in Sudan, and they were not able to dissemble. The, they weren't able to dismantle some centers because there is social consciousness that this has to continue. So be careful with the policies of states, but we have to have an agreement at the basis because that is the sustainability of the system. As far as urban reform is concerned, I insist that, and also said in the morning that we don't have to think that the health sector organizes the rest of the social policy. What do we have to have is a sort of a, 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 a synchronization with other policies, urban reform, other policies like the environment or, or um, food policies and so on, education and so on. So I believe that. We have to be a little bit more, I mean, not, not very strict, not so strict. We are a part of what we live in, and we have to think how we live within our social policies with uh, transferable uh, purposes and share the problems. We see now we have some questions here that have to do with the industrial medical complex or the economic industrial complex of health. 
Gonzalo Moyano from Argentina, for example, says, which is the importance for the construction of universal systems of public production of drugs and medicine and promotion of research in the universal systems? And another one refers to another question. Please comment on the growing relevance of health within the economic space. I think that takes us to a very important landscape. So, if you are so kind, I believe that if we wish to go beyond the debate that we have between the two models, I think that behind that, we have the environment of health, which is a very important environment within the economics, from 6% of the GDP to the 18 of the GDP. In the United States, for example, and so at a time when there are a lot of problems and barriers to find areas that allow the creation of revenue, uh, um, the production of revenue, this environment, this area is uh, very attractive and in terms of investment. And at a certain time, someone said that health is too important to leave it to the doctors or medical doctors. And now what it seems to be is that the health is too important to be left alone to the state. So the private sector has to address that. If I can go into a sector of the economy where do we have more or less in between 6 and 18% of the GDP, of course, it is an important sector. And that is why in the new agreements of free trade agreements, that is why we found the free mobility of ins insurance companies and providers of services, which have a very important role there. And therefore, in those terms, I believe that we should see what, it, what that is behind those areas. So in a situation where we have a great difficulty or problems or barriers to generate income that are, that are not purely spe uh, speculation, then I believe that the term the um, the work in the area of health is very important, but also that has a limit, a very relevant limit, which I think was very well illustrated with the reform that Obama tried to uh, put into practice. First Clinton, then Obama, which is, was the economic problem or value in this it was that the costs of health insurance got the cost of the products of the United States uh, very expensive or higher in terms of price. In a, I don't know who bought the Ford Motor Company, but at a certain moment, not a long time ago, the cost of the health insurance in a Ford car was the double of steel. So initially, what the United States tried to do when the when the free trade agreements appear was to accuse Canada and Mexico because saying that Canada and Mexico uh, in the NAFTA had the idea of withdrawing the health system and they took it to the body of uh, arbitration 
and they were not able to achieve anything. So, the, so you need, you see, the private insurance sector is going into the scheme. So, what Obama wanted to do was to make the industry more competitive, and no economy will be able to devote 18 or 19 percent of the uh, GDP in medical services. And those who say that the uh, insur insurance is limiting their cost, you can see the great example of these companies in the United States. There is no cost cutting. There was um, costs are not being reduced in the United States. So, I think that as regards the national production of drugs and medicine, I think that each country has to do it in, in case by case. Brazil is, they are processing many new things. In Mexico, the, season, the production was disassembled, vaccines, drugs, and so on. At this moment, to try to have public production uh, has many problems. For example, we may have solutions, and we spend 10% of our budget in health, but there is a problem there. But the more complex things, no. So again, the response to this question, in principle, is better to have a public production, but it is not so easy to achieve it in the conditions of competition that we have today. There are many you know, questions, but comments, uh, a lot of congratulations. There are many questions if you can take this conference to other countries. Um, also, the director, if your presentation will be available, I will. I would say yes. Not only the presentation in PowerPoint, but a document that Dr. Laurel has prepared that you will find as of tomorrow on the web page of the institute and will be available for all of you. But there are two more questions that take us to the international area. One is from Ana Costa that asks, please comment on the uh, how is it that in the United Nations system the interest of insurance has gone uh, into that. How to do it in order to promote universal systems when those interests, I mean of those of ins insurance, seem to be uh, coping the international organizations? And also they ask if there are uh, movements against uh, the Germany. There are development differing uh, situations in face of this. Uh. Well, I think that, uh, yes, there is a strong penetration of the whole idea of insurance within the different agencies of the United Nations mainly in the OES also, if there are anti-Germanic movements in Latin America, we were able, in a certain level, control our uh, continental body, because uh, PAHO, what was done through the organizations, our organizations, we were able to reach that uh, to a certain point. I think that uh, there are many issues simultaneously playing in this game. If you see historically the idea of these insurancing, universal insurancing, I would say that it's linked to what was the second reform of the state that took place by uh, the last years of the 90s and this idea of the universal insurance uh, was launched like a way of uh, reaching this. Who introduces it has done uh, usually are the Bretton Woods uh, bodies, the um, 
monetary fund, uh, etc. But the foundations, Rockefeller, Bill Gates, etc. And uh, this is done in uh, different ways, I would say. The first way is that the mainly uh, the Bretton Woods uh, bodies, mainly the Inter-American Development Bank, have a lot of capacity uh, decision-making regarding what the countries are going to do. Because uh, when you have economic problems in a country, the countries depend on uh, the uh, World Bank, etc., for the loans. Uh, well, we're going to loan you money if you do such and such thing, and they have an army of advisors uh, that go, well, you should do this, this, and that over here, etc. And they have uh, ended with the uh, tremendous forest printing documents that turn them into hegemonic issues. If we add uh, the fact that uh, the power at the present moment depends 80% of the financing, and it's external to the World Health Organization, who are the great financiers of this? the World Bank, the great foundations, they have very little independence regarding this body. This means that the personnel of the WHO have no participation in this. I would say no. There is a co-responsibility. <clears throat> I don't know if they're convinced of the sheer interest with this body or because of pragmatism. Those who have the money, uh, the World Bank, let's follow the path. What I could say as a defense of uh, PAHO and uh, WHO, they have maintained the idea of the right to health. But when we see that what they're proposing, they're proposing the health insurance. If you read the document of financing of the health system, it's a document where you, you never talk about the possibility of a NIC system, but how you can expand the insurance. I think that here, yes, we have an issue, a topic where I would say this is something that is ideological and political and economic, where I think, and we have seen this here in Brazil, when the Conference of the Social Determinants was carried out, WHO didn't want to include anything about uh, Health and insurance. In the Social Determinants Conference, you don't want to mention the poverty is growing, unemployment is growing, that are dismantling different things. What's happening? We were able to obtain through a uh, talk between the different organizations, civil organizations, to have this included. And Sevis, Alamis, Organization of Students, and this was included in the lobbying. Uh, CUT, also CUT, was an offense to a document about social determinants, not including poverty, etc. And we included something else because we supported uh, without lobbying that was the fact that we could include patents because that's not included. Nothing that had to do 
with the marginalization of all of this. What are the possibilities we have? many possibilities of having different types of agreements. UNASUR should have a very important role in this. But we have to convince the governments of UNASUR. And there are organizations of activists in health in different parts of the world. And if we ask, if you ask us, uh, why do uh, people that are watching us in Vietnam, because there are people of the, the third world, <coughs> but the health movement is staying to the Latin American, express yourself more directly, and not with so many goings around. Thank you, Christina. First of all, I'm sorry with many of uh, the people present here and participants through Internet because it's not going to be possible to finish the great amount of questions that we have. Just the last uh, round, there are three countries, and it's important for Salud, Ecuador, from El Salvador, and they were asking if you could comment the importance of a tax reform to sustain and turn feasible a health system. Yes, I think that this is a central topic. What I would like to say regarding this is we're going to have a single or unique uh, health system to work, we need resources, and this goes through a tax reform. But we should see what are the characteristics of this tax reform. In the countries where the health insurance uh, is, were carried out, a change was carried out, those who pay the contribution for the insurance are the workers. In Chile, for example, the only ones who contribute are the workers. In other sides, uh, in other countries, done that a part is use of uh, state uh, resources, and other part is covered by the contribution of each uh, worker. How this was financed? That means that uh, there is a line of thought of who should finance this. I could say that the, and that the international bodies couldn't care less if it's a government uh, financing or personal contributions. Uh, we can't find anything that states that uh, should be state the state that supply. But what is underlying all of this the, is the tax reform. In Mexico, they want to carry out a tax reform to finance a universal health insurance. And how this is going to be done? Through an increase in taxes. That is uh, something that's absurd. But at a moment, the uh, progressive forces were against this. And if this is done on a system where you have a tremendous corruption and the high officials have a, a stratospheric salaries a hundred times above the minimum wage, that doesn't have a popular support to have this type of tax reform. Together with tax reform, you should include the commitment and the explicit commitment that these resources, public resources, are going to be used correctly. And part of these resources are going to be redistributed 
to do the public provision of the services. So I think that uh, this issue of the tax reform, that I think it's necessary to be done. It's obvious if I want to have a public system, a health system working, of course, I have to have the resources, and I have to include those resources. But this should be done under the conditions where effectively it should have a clear impact of distribution. And of course, we should combat corruption, because that's the only way that you're going to be able to put a break on this money that is uh, being exhausted through the drain. In Mexico, 8 to 15 percent of the GDP is lost in corruption. And if you give me this uh, for health, I will give you a marvelous uh, system. Of course, there is a need to get in depth of this discussion. Unfortunately, the type of uh, transmission has ended. There are a lot of interesting questions at hand. We, those who are participating through internet, you're going to have available. We're going to be able to comment some of the questions, but now we have to close the event. And we ask uh, to Minister Temporan to. Muchas gracias, Oscar. Thank you, Oscar. I would like to thank uh, my dear friend for her participation and uh, who gave us this wonderful talk. I would like to thank all of you who came, uh, those who are practitioners in this area, professors, and those who followed us uh, in the social network, uh, the internet was over 340 uh, access. So we have basically all countries in uh, the Americas, people from uh, uh, Europe as well, and to uh, invite all of you to follow ISAG in the international network, in the struggle and the war uh, for uh, universal right uh, to access to health. So good afternoon to all of you. Thank you very much.